Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Minasan, konnichiwa. Welcome to today's special webinar hosted by the Japan America Society of Georgia and the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth. My name is Yoshi Domoto. I am the executive director of the Japan America Society of Georgia, and I'm so glad and so thrilled uh, to be able to present this program today uh, regarding what is happening with air travel right now and the future of air travel. Uh, as we have some special uh, panelists, experts of the industry uh, with us uh, today and this afternoon. Uh, but certainly, uh, I'm sure it's the same with uh, Texas and Dallas and Fort Worth, but Japan is the number one foreign investor in our state of Georgia. There's over 600 Japanese affiliated companies here uh, that have done business, uh, bringing in close to $11 billion in our state's economy. Uh, and certainly over 35,000 Georgians are employed at these companies. So Japan and Georgia, we certainly share a very close economic tie and we have uh, a lot going on culturally and educationally as well as students going back and forth between our two countries. But before we get started with today's uh, webinar, we'd like to thank our sponsors um, from Atlanta, my favorite airport, the Hartsfield Jackson, Atlanta International Airport. We have a very special speaker uh, from our airport here today with us. Uh, and then the official airline of the Japan America Society of Georgia, uh, Delta Airlines. Uh, and then we also have uh, Japan Airlines uh, who I have a connection to as my father used to work for JAL back in the day when I was a young boy. So I've spent um, many times and uh, many uh, hours uh, at the Narita Airport hanging out uh, at the, the JAL counters. But, uh, but we are so thrilled to have uh, the Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport, Delta Airlines and Japan Airlines with us. So thank you so much for being with us. And at this time, we'd like to introduce uh, my counterpart uh, and co-host with the Japan American Society of Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, the executive director there, uh, Mr. Paul Pass. Paul? Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, Yoshi. Uh, hello and good afternoon. It is a, a pleasure to, uh, to invite everyone to our air travel event, which is a partnership between the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth and the Japan America Society of Georgia. We are excited to share that over 160 people have registered, representing 22 states and five countries including Japan and the US. Again, my name is Paul Pass and I'm the Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. We are happy that you could join us during both the Japan America Society Dallas-Fort Worth's 50th anniversary and the Japan America Society of Georgia's 40th anniversary seasons. I want to express my gratitude to my Atlanta counterpart, Yoshi Domoto, his entire team, our moderator, Nozomi Morgan, and all our speakers for their hard work and dedication Helping, helping our audience learn more about the current state of the airline industry. A special welcome to our panelists and attendees connected with American Airlines and Japan Airlines, which are both corporate members of the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. Lastly, I wanted to go over some suggestions to maximize your experience. Please note that your cameras and microphones are off, and if there are any technical issues, such as you are unable to hear the presenters, then please use the chat function. If you have questions during the event, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to ask early since we may not be able to address all questions. Please also note that this webinar will be recorded and we plan to upload to YouTube soon. Now to begin our program is Nozomi Morgan, who is president and founder of Michiki Morgan Worldwide. Nozomi, please feel free to begin. Hi, well, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Yosan. Um, and welcome everyone. We are so excited to have such an amazing um, panel and such a, a wonderful group of people attending today. And just as Paul said, um, we know that uh, you're attending from 22 states and five different countries. I would love, love to hear where you're joining in from. So, um, and also it's a great way to, to test the chat box. So let's see if you can um, enter where you're joining in from today in the chat box. So, um, I'll, and including the panelists. Oh, great, we, uh, the first David, thank you, from Columbus, Ohio. We'll love to see where you're joining in from today. Let us know. Oh, wonderful, San Francisco, Dallas. Awesome, this is extremely exciting. Cool, cool, well, thank you, keep it coming. That really gives us energy as well. So thank you so, so much. Yay, from Atlanta, thank you. So um, talking about air travel, I just wanted to kind of 
um, set the set the stage of uh, you know what the what the industry is really um, looking at right now. And a lot of you already might know this, but just in case, so that we can all have the, like the same um, knowledge here. So last year there were 4.5 billion passengers around the world and over 100,000 commercial flights were flying throughout the skies of, of, of this earth. And um, the airline industry, or the air travel industry, I should say, supports um, 10 million jobs directly, um, according to Air Transportation Action Group, and also um, 6 million at airports, including you know, the staffs at the shops and cafes and the luggage handlers and the cooks with the in-flight meals. And um, for airline workers, it's about 2.7 million and um, about uh, close to 1.5 million who are uh, associated with building the planes. So it's a huge industry that we're talking about. And when you talk about revenue, um, it's about 170 billion for the world's airports and for airlines, um, it's about $840 billion in 2019. And so, with COVID, what happened was, and this is just numbers that I saw in the news from um, one of the largest airlines here in, in domestically in the US, like for example, Southwest Airlines, their um, revenue is expecting to fall um, by 95% compared to last year. So that's part of like the, the damage that the industry is feeling. Um, and from uh, looking at the IETA, the Air, uh, International Air Transport Association numbers, they're estimating that 2020 will go down as the worst year in history for aviation. And the loss um, is worse than the financial crisis, which was 30 billion. They're estimating their airline passenger revenue loss will be $314 billion globally. So if you can just, for, for us who's lived long enough and remembers that financial crisis, we're talking about um, 10 times even larger than that time. Um, and also if we talk about airports, since we have um, Elliot here, which is amazing to have him here, um, the airport, airport loss, uh, it's estimating about 60%, oh, excuse me, um, their, their loss is significant as well. And, um, you know, the airport is again like a little city. You're, you actually, it's not just the people that fly, but you have the cafes, the, the shops, the, the people who cook. There's so many that are really impacted um, by this, this uh, COVID. So today it's, it's really exciting to have experts from, you know, Atlanta, Hartsville Jackson, Atlanta International Airport. We have experts from um, Japan Airlines, Delta Airlines, um, because what we're, what I'm seeing with all the research, it's showing right now that the recovery um, to pre-COVID will take anywhere from two to, um, two years is the optimistic side, two to six years of recovery. So we have a lot ahead of us. And for myself personally, um, I used to travel a lot for business and I haven't traveled since February. Um, and I think a lot of the people here that are attending are having the same experience that they either um, want to travel but are too scared to travel or they're traveling already for business because they have to, but really feeling unsure. So we are um, looking to um, really hear from um, our experts and we would love to get questions and comments from you. So just like Paul said, um, if you have any questions, please enter in the Q&A box. For those um, looking at your screen right now, the, there's a little icon on the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. So please enter questions there. We will have time at the end um, to answer your questions. Okay, so I had took a little bit more time than I probably should have. Um, but let's get started. So let me introduce um, our amazing speakers today. So I'm going to start with um, Elliot Page. He's the Director for Air Service Development at Hartsford Jackson Atlanta International Airport. Elliot, welcome. So great. So wonderful to have you today. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is great. Yeah, wonderful. So should we um, should we start the video right now? Would that be? Uh, yeah. Yeah, why okay. don't we? Why don't we start with the video and okay. then, uh, you know, and then I'll talk after that. Okay, sounds great. Your son.
Would you help us with the video, please? We are Metro Atlanta's gateway to the world, enabling nonstop access to some 70 international destinations in more than 45 countries. With award-winning efficiency, world-class concessions, and a commitment to exceeding your expectations. For the student returning after her first semester away. For international visitors reconnecting with their families. For the valiant men and women in uniform. Thank you, Elliot. That is a beautiful video. So tell us a little bit what, what efforts initiatives you're, that you're doing at the airport in the current state. Well, um, so I'm Elliot Page. I'm the airport director for air service development. And uh, my main role is to build uh, new routes to connection to Atlanta. So working with uh, all the different airlines, uh, both present and potential airlines to, to start air service uh, to Atlanta. And I do this for both cargo and passenger. So, you know, at Atlanta, as you know, is the, the world's busiest airport. Uh, on a typical day, um, this time last year, we would have close to 300,000 passengers uh, passing through the airport. Um, today, uh, we have about 71,000 passengers passing through the airport. And that's a vast improvement from, uh, from March and April of this year, when we saw figures as low as 5,000 uh, passengers. So, um, it, you know, COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on, on, on us as, as it has on, on the entire industry. Um, we, we, we struggle to, to find, uh, to, to, to really to help passengers improve I have meetings regularly every day just to talk to passengers. I'll talk to all different stakeholders about how can we make it safer uh, for passengers? How can we create more confidence in the industry uh, so that people can fly more and are interested more to fly? And, and, and you know, during the course of this discussion, I hope to talk some about that. And I think the, one of the key uh, things that we're doing is implementation of new technology um, a lot of that is, is really helping to create touchless environments uh, to make passengers feel safe. I think you'll hear some of that from, from our partners as well, from Delta and from uh, uh, Japan, Japan Airlines um, and many of our stakeholders. You know, the aim is really how can we create confidence so that passengers feel safe from our airport to their destination. And uh, there are a lot of different things that we're doing towards that. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you so much. I just saw uh, one of the comments that they were saying, um, uh, the, you know, the video was beautiful. And how do I get my daughter to greet me so cheerfully when she comes from college? That was one of the questions um, that I saw. So bring it, gifts. It's just, bring gifts. <laughs> bring gifts. But I think it really shows how important there's um, the airport is not just a place for transportation. There's so many memories, so many experiences yeah. um, that happens at the airport. So it's a significant part of a lot of our lives. I can um, attest to myself, my own um, family too. We, we um, you know, move from country to country so many times. I have so many memories at the airport. Um, so it's such a... Um, important place. So thank you. And we have so much that we want to hear from you. I'm going to move on. Yeah, to the next uh, uh, panelist we have today is uh, Mr. Uh, Akinori Yokosawa. He's a manager of uh, in joint venture Asia market at Delta Airlines. Welcome, Akisang. Thank you, Nozomi. Uh, can I go ahead and say a few words? Yeah, and, or do you want to do the video first? Uh, no, I, I say a few words first. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everybody. And uh, I'm Akinori Okosawa with Delta Airlines. Uh, first of all, uh, I hope everybody's doing fine and everybody's staying safe. Uh, as uh, you know, the, 
not only mentioned, uh, we, you know, we had a, a, the best year in our 95 year history in 2019. Uh, Delta carried over 200 million passengers last year, which is a good number. And on daily average, we carried about 600,000 passengers. And it went down to only about 50,000 a day back in April. So we saw about a drop of 95% our passengers year by year, that was definitely a significant impact. And we kind of started seeing some recovery in domestic market in July and August. And then we kind of started seeing another spike of infection in domestic market. So uh, I, I think that this recovery is going to be very bumpy on the long term, uh, even though the domestic market is back to about 45, 50% in August. Uh, international market is still so far from recovery, including Japan. So uh, what the Delta is trying to do is, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, we try to be the best downtime performance airline, uh, but we completely changed our priority. And the Delta want to be the safest airline. And we introduced a program called the Delta Care Standard. That's kind of a, the, the uh, whole process of uh, uh, offering additional safety and cleanliness to the passengers. So I'd like to share a video uh, to show you what we are doing right now uh, for each one of the flight. So Yoshi, if you can play the video, that's great. Delta's dedication to cleanliness and safety can be seen at every step along the customer's travel journey. And with the establishment of our new global cleanliness organization, we are committed now more than ever to finding new ways to innovate both in our product and our processes. This new organization is yet another way that Delta has differentiated itself from the other airlines. Our focus on providing a clean experience is really critical today but it will serve as an important commitment to our customers well into the future. Through frequent and thorough sanitizing of airport surfaces, fewer touch points for onboard food and beverage service, and the availability of a touchless travel experience on the Fly Delta app, we are providing superior service with safety in mind. The enhanced deep cleaning that now takes place before every flight includes a thorough electrostatic spraying along with a complete manual cleaning of surfaces. Our cleaning processes are comprehensive and they include multiple layers of protection that when applied together provide Delta customers with one of the safest and cleanest environments both on the ground and in the air. The cleaning solutions we use are highly effective, high-grade disinfectants. They are safe to use on all cabin surfaces and are approved for use against COVID-19. The electrostatic spray technology works in a similar manner to the familiar static electricity created when you rub two surfaces together. The sprayer adds an electrostatic charge to the liquid and within seconds, these positively charged droplets of disinfectant are attracted to nearby surfaces. Special cleaning crews then detail every part of the plane, including those hard to reach places. Flight attendants and gate agents are an important part of our onboard protocols as well. Just prior to customer boarding, they do a thorough inspection of the aircraft. Each flight crew is also supplied with wipes for onboard cleaning. In addition to cleaning high touch surfaces, we are constantly looking for new ways to ensure lavatories stay tidy from takeoff to touchdown. Altogether, these layers of protection provide a deeper, more effective clean. Finally, for added peace of mind during boarding, each customer is offered a disinfectant wipe for personal use. Our pre-packaged care kits and snack bags are designed and distributed to safely equip customers with the essentials they will need during travel. At Delta, our global cleanliness team is committed to providing the cleanest, safest, and best flying experience in the industry. Innovation and continuous improvement is part of our DNA at Delta, and we've used this challenging environment to help accelerate our thinking, where we're constantly looking for new innovation and technology to help us better serve and protect our customers and our people. Stay tuned to news.delta.com for all the latest information, and we'll look forward to seeing you on a Delta flight soon.
wonderful. Thank you, Aksan. Thank you. So, so Delta was, it was, was representing um, our you know, US global carrier. And today we, are, we have the wonderful honor to have a, a Japanese global carrier here today. Um, so Steve Smith is a vice president and head of global sales at Japan Airlines. Welcome, Steve. Hi, how are you, is everyone today? I just want to take a moment to thank you for having us. I uh, appreciate uh, Paul and Yoshi and Nozomi. And also to Elliot and Aki, enjoy you guys on the uh, on the group today. Uh, my particular role with the uh, company is we are an international. Uh, we do fly to many different countries, and we've had we've all had to go through this um, unprecedented time right now with the COVID. It struck us pretty heavily, and back in February of this year. So I think everybody's had the same issues about losing uh, flight, losing revenue, and really trying their very best to um, be able to, you know, improve the area. So one of the things I wanted to share with all of you today, there's really two things. First of all, we have a video that's, I believe, uh, accessible for all today. And it really is, uh, it's about Delta's um, safety, uh, basically your safety, uh, our priority. This particular video that we're looking at right now is not that video, but uh, you'll be able to access it. This particular video is on the HEPA filter, which is the particulate air filter, which stands for HEPA. We're gonna show you in this short 40 second video, 99.97% .97 of fine airborne particles. This is a cross cut of the airplane and you can follow as the air comes down into the filters and through the air, air engines up to the top and distributes through the cabin on a downward flow, goes through the filters and then remixes with air from the outside. So what happens is every two to three minutes, you're getting a clean and sterile um, cabin. And on our aircraft, we have every single JAL aircraft in our system that has HEPA filters. This has been a really, really, uh, really good thing for all of our, our passengers. And one of the things I wanted to make is that when IATA did a survey, this was one of the five areas that passengers were very concerned about was HEPA. So we want to make sure everyone knows that the HEPA air filters are is similar to being in a hospital environment. They're very clean, very efficient job for us. And the other video is just basically everything that we talked about earlier with keeping the airplane, working in the airport environment with guys like Elliot all over the world, different airports work different ways. We wanna make sure that it's a touchless, contactless environment. We're seeing lots of improvements on the technological um, setup as well as what we do in the cabin uh, for our customers throughout. So I think I'll just go ahead and end it there and uh, turn it back over to you. Thank you very much again for having me. Thank you, Steve. So, um, so Steve just shared with us the Japan Airlines Fly Safe video with the HIPAA filter. And um, if you go to the chat box right now, there's two links to YouTube. So, um, so you can go and look at it and, um, at your own um, at your own convenience. Um, so, so this is from from Japan Airlines. Thank you so much, Steve. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's such a um, such a unique opportunity to have a, a, a Japanese airline and American Global Airline and the biggest airport in the world to be here today on the same panel. So I am going to dive into the questions. Um, and we have so many questions already coming in the Q&A. So what I might do is because we're already almost at 1.30 uh, Eastern time, um, we might have to shorten the panel and go uh, into the Q&A a little bit quicker than we initially planned. Is that okay with everyone that work? Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. So Steve, actually you kicked us off uh, around technology with the HIPAA filter, um, talking about that's hospital grade. Um, mm. I know Elliot at the airport, you're leading a lot of new technologies. So can you share with us um, what kind of technology type of technology you're using right now to combat the COVID-19 and keeping your passengers visitors safe? Sure, uh, well, interestingly, we started implementing different new technology prior to COVID. 
And it's just our aim always to, uh, to increase efficiency and to make passengers comfortable. And you know, one of the best ways to do that is through technology. So for instance, in 2019, we, uh, we worked with Delta to implement uh, facial recognition uh, at the check-in counter on an international terminal. And, and so that's been up and operational uh, for the international passengers. And we had planned even then to roll it out to uh, on the domestic side. So, um, so now we're looking at, um, and, and with the international facial recognition, if for those of you not familiar with it, simply you, you walk up to the kiosk and a camera recognizes your face and it tells whether or not you have a flight and it, it prints your boarding pass or uh, perhaps you have the, the boarding pass already on your, on your phone. Um, so it does all of that through touchless technology. And when you board uh, through the gate, it also again recognizes your face and matches you to the person that checked in. So it's, it's, it's linked to uh, Customs and Border Protection database uh, for known travelers programs. So uh, we have a database of, of that program that's accessed only when uh, you're checking in. Um, so now we're doing it for, uh, for domestic passengers. And um, we're now implementing that, that program. Uh, it'll take us a couple of months to, to implement. We, we had planned to start in March and we got sidetracked of course, because of uh, COVID, uh, but this this program will will scan uh, your ID or your um, your driver's license and and create a three dimensional picture of your face, and then you can use that for so, for for facial recognition as well. So that program um, and part of it we're working with TSA, so that we it, it will be connected to a TSA database. It's a common use program, which means all the airlines will be using it. And now that we have COVID and now that airlines realize that, and we all realize that we need to push for uh, these, this touchless technology, um, a lot of that is now being fast-tracked as much as possible. Um, another thing we have is um, our, some of our, our directories. Uh, our typical directories were these big screens that you had to touch to see you know, you wanted to, a particular restaurant, so you would look on the restaurant, you know, you know the, the atypical directories that you'd see in most airports. Today we have, um, we're implementing and we're removing a lot of those old ones and replacing them with a, a new directory that has a, a, a laser scan for your boarding pass. So it will scan either your paper boarding pass or your uh, electronic boarding pass on your, your smartphone. And uh, the technology will tell you uh, exactly where your gate is, how to get to your gate. Uh, and you can also select features that would tell you if you're looking for a particular type of restaurant or type of food or retail, it'll tell you those that are along the, the, the pathway to your gate so that you can minimize walking around and save time, but also minimize contact with a lot of other people. So uh, those are some of the new technologies that we're, we're implementing. And that's just on the passenger side. On the cargo side, we realize we, we've, um, and we've had to reduce the amount of paper being passed around, the airway bills and so forth. So uh, we implemented a system called a cargo community system in, in November last year, prior to any knowledge of COVID. And uh, suddenly we realized that it, it, this is beneficial for COVID as well. It's, it's touchless technology. It's basically digital cargo. So uh, you can track and trace cargo from the time it takes off uh, on it, from wheels up to uh, before it lands. And you can tell what it is, you know, whether or not it's short. Uh, you can get full information on, on a specific, uh, specific consignment. So you know, these are some of the technologies. Um, some we've started to implement since 2019. Some we're now trying to fast track because of COVID. Um, the aim is really to, to just to keep passengers safe. And of course, we're doing all the other things of wearing masks and, and uh, checking temperatures and so forth for certain for staff that are entering in certain areas. Um, and, you know, really trying to reduce a lot of touch points on the airport. So these are some of the things that we're doing now. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Um, it was just amazing. And, and just like you said, how a lot of things you were already uh, were planned before COVID, but it really pushed the timeline out of necessity. Yeah. Um, and I hear that a lot in a lot of industries, wow. not just uh, in air travel. There's like overnight, the priorities have just drastically changed. Yeah. So thank you. Great. So um, Steve and Exxon, do you have um, any from the airline side, like new technologies uh, or technologies are coming uh, that you have in the future that you're uh, planning to implement that you'd like to share? Oh. We have it already. Yes. Rocky, go ahead. Okay, so uh, for Delta, just like Elliot mentioned, uh, we are we are kind of pushing, uh, you know, more touchless technologies. You know, Delta strongly encourage passengers to, you know, download and use Delta app. I think that's kind of one-stop shopping. You, know, you can do check-in, you can go through TSA security checkpoint, and you can use also use the Delta app for boarding. So, uh, you know, we, we strong, strongly encourage customers to use Delta app. And also, as Eric mentioned, uh, we, we try to expand the introduction of the facial recognition, not only at the international flights, but also for domestic flights and also for the airport. And this technology is developed by one of the Japanese companies, so I'm, I'm proud to mention that. So I think it's kind of a combination of new technology and the you know, existing technologies. And uh, for us, the key is to kind of reduce the touch point for the passengers using the technology. I so, see. Yeah, that makes sense. Steve, would you like to, um, to add? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I, I think is really very interesting for all of us is to make sure that we are listening to the customers in this time, because it's very, very, it's, it's really challenging because information that you get one day could very well be different the next day and things are constantly changing. So one of the things that we did was we really focused in on the IATA survey that they did with customers right after this happened. And so I'd just like to, to share with you the five areas that really were the biggest concerns for the customers. The first one was, the biggest concern was they were concerned about, 83% was concerned about contracting the virus. 65% were concerned about sitting next to someone with the virus on the airplane. 87% uh, were concerned about quarantines as you go to different airports. 83% uh, were also concerned about people wearing masks. And another 57% were actually worried about the air on the airplane, which I just covered with our video a little while ago. But I think if you look back at the travel ribbon, and that is from the time you enter the airport until the time that you deboard the airplane and go to your destination, all along that path, there's going to be technology that needs to change from where it used to be. If you look back uh, for the financials, uh, that we had back in 2008 and the, and the security issues that we had in 2001, 9-11, we had to change things then. We're probably going to need to change things now with more of a, a biosecurity system. Is there going to be an electronic uh, uh, health immunity card that you're going to have? How are airports going to be looking at processing passengers in different international destinations? You're, you're talking about government to government and not not city to city like you do in the US. So there's a lot of ramifications, but all along that ribbon, it's really, really important. Many, many customers are concerned about just getting in a bus and going to the airport or getting on a bus and going from terminal to terminal because social distancing is very difficult to adhere to, right? And the same thing with sitting on an airplane. It's very hard to social distance when the airplane seats are so close. So. There's a lot of different challenges along the way. I think the most important thing though is for us is that we are working together as an industry. I think technology, you're gonna see a lot of touchless contact stuff at the airport where you're really not gonna be able to have to touch anything. It's actually gonna be able to walk in the airport, it's gonna be able to scan your face, it's actually gonna be able to scan your wallet and see what kind of credit card you're in there and what you pay and you get on the airplane, it's gonna know you when you go through the gates. When you leave in the destination, same thing when you, when you clear customs, it's gonna temperature check you both ways. All that is gonna to be touchless and that's gonna be what we're looking for in the future, I think. So it's exciting, but there's a lot of changes. Oh, I can't hear you. She's on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, I'm trying to mute myself and someone tries to mute myself. Okay, oh, apologies. So how soon do you think the actual consumers We'll, we'll see that, see that um, 
um, at the airport or um, during their air travel. I think okay. this is the real this is the real challenge, Zomi, because if you think about it, many airports are already working on some things, but you know I I don't know if there's I, I really can, I'm concerned about the government connection with all the different airports. Mm -hmm. Some airports uh, in the far Middle East were already doing tests. They thought that was really cool because they got the answer in 10 minutes and it finds out that only 20% accuracy. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that people jump to. So I think putting a timeline on it is, is quite a challenge. I, I don't know if that's really fair, but I think everybody is continuing to work toward a better product. And I think that's the most important thing for all of us. Mm -hmm. So Great. We're, we're pushing as much as we can. I can Thank assure you. Thank you. Elliot, it looks like you wanted to say something. No, oh, from from the airport's perspective, uh, it it's challenging because we you know we're really pushing to get a lot of things implemented. Some of which we started. So facial recognition is already there on the international concourse with Delta, and uh, we're working to roll that out with all the other carriers as well. And as I mentioned, we we we're, we're probably about uh, I, I don't want to put a timeline on it, but at least by the end of this year, we should start the pilot for the domestic. Uh, facial recognition program. Um, we also have, I, I forgot to mention earlier, we also have um, part of that, the, the check-in program is also self uh, check-in of your bags. Mm -hmm. So you check in your bags yourself. And again, that's also based on facial recognition program. That's about nine months away for us. Uh, we're, we're, we're piloting it now and perhaps in about nine months we should implement it. Um, another thing that we do and and this, as an airport with that magnitude, with that number of passengers, you know, sometimes on the good days, 300,000 passengers in a, in a day. And because we're talking about a contagion, a virus uh, that if you have too many people close together, you can have contagion. We are also trying to, we're also monitoring uh, passenger behavior and passenger movements in selected areas of uh, of the different concourses because we have seven concourses uh, and, and so we, we need to, we're using beacon technology to kind of monitor where are the areas in which we have uh, a lot of passengers close together and, and therefore what do we need to do to modify that area? It may be that we have a restaurant and we have too many chairs that are close together and it or, or the way that particular area of a concourse is configured with the signs and so forth, the chairs, uh, it's causing the passengers to, to congregate too close together in a, spe a specific area. And we need to then reconfigure and redesign that area in order to disperse them and spread them out, yet while maintaining efficiency so that they can board their flight uh, on time and so forth. So the, there is that program being implemented as well. That's uh, probably won't be completely active until sometime next year. Uh, it involves a lot of uh, implementing different sensors at uh, different parts of the airport. Right now it's only in, uh, in on the air side, that is inside security. Um, but I know of other airports that have this technology and other types of crowd management technology from curbside all the way to gate. And that's important because you, you know, congregating at the curbside is also a problem. And it's something that the airport needs to look at. So, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time typically as an airport monitoring the science of human behavior and crowds and how they move and what drives passengers to a particular area. So simple things like lines that, uh, and the tiles and in the roof the ceiling that guides passengers to subliminally or subconsciously walk in a particular direction. We do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we, we're, we've found ourselves with a new challenge of how do, we, how do we keep the passengers moving efficiently, but not too much crowd and you know, how do we reduce contagion? So it's, it's a new and unfortunately exciting challenge for some of us who love this kind of work, but it's, it's necessary. Yes. That's fascinating, all the, the, the that behavioral science, that subconscious, um, uh, it's amazing all these things that as a passenger you don't notice, but you're guided through. So that's fascinating. 
would love, we need to do another session, talk more about this. Um, today, I've, you know, we don't have enough time, but there's so many things. Um, there's so much more I would love to hear. Uh, thank you, Elliot. So we are at um, the time that I think uh, we need to move on to Q&A. And there's a lot of questions from the audience that actually we were planning to ask anyway. So I'm going to go through the questions and they're not gonna necessarily be in order. It's, I'm going to try to um, put together some questions that are kind of similar and ask and hopefully we can get through most of them. Um, but we have so many questions, it's, it's amazing. So bear with me a little bit. And um, Paul and Yoshi-san, if you can help me navigate through this a little bit, if there's any tip, some question, uh, any questions that stands out, um, please let me know as well. So here we go. And I'm just gonna throw out the question. And so Steve, Aksung, um, Elliot, please feel free to answer whichever ones that you feel like you um, have most to, to say, I should say. So one of the first questions I had, I hear this a lot, is how feasible is it to measure all the passengers' temperatures and how effective is this? Anyone? Steve. Yeah, Steve. I'll, I'll take um, I'll take that one because that's something that we've been doing for years, actually. Um, in our airports in uh, Tokyo specifically, but in some of the international airports, when you come off of an airplane uh, and go into the immigration area, you have to walk by um, the vi the visual uh, temperature checks, and they scan you as you go through. And they have a team of about four or five medical people there. And so that if you ever get a reading that's over, they set the range between, I think, 97 and 98 and a half, 99. If there's anything outside that range, they'll pull you out of line and they'll give you a little more detailed test. Now that's ongoing. Now they're, they have something they're doing at, before you even get on the airplane. So they're testing you and they have touchless uh, thermometers that actually can go they don't even have to touch you. They can just scan you from far away and they'll be able to tell what your temperature is. So the answer to the question, as I understand it, is that something that we feel good about? Yes, we do feel good about it. We believe it's something that will help keep people from boarding an airplane who might be sick or might be ill, especially for a big connecting airport. You might get on the airplane as a customer uh, in one city and by the time you get to the connecting airport, you're sick and you wouldn't have known, you know? So that's why it's a good thing to check on all, on all areas. So we feel pretty comfortable about that. I'm sure the technology is gonna get uh, better and better as we go forward, but for right now, we feel pretty good with what we have. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So we've been getting uh, kind of related to um, temperature check and also with um, Elliot, what you shared, and. Um, Aksan, Steve, you all shared about the facial recognition. We're getting a lot of questions around um, privacy, privacy concerns. Um, so for example, let me pick one of the questions here. If I can find one. So for example, um, facial recognition temperatures and reports, is that against privacy and civil rights? Is this authorized by law? Can anyone talk to that as, as much as you know? Uh, from what I'm aware of, um, so for, for governments, it's very difficult, for, at least for the U.S. government, it's difficult to collect uh, temperature without the, the permission of the individual. So in other countries, I know that they're similar to what Steve outlined. Uh, there, there are systems that check every passenger uh, temperature that passes a particular area. Um, even Liberia, my last travel mission in uh, in February of this year, there was a computerized uh, temperature uh, camera that checked everyone's temperature as you got off the aircraft. Um, so in terms of uh, monitoring beacons and so forth, th this is something that's done by your, your regular Home Depot or your Walmart or, uh, you know, every other, um, every other organization, basically. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a particular aisle of uh, Home Depot and then you start getting adverts for that the products in that aisle on your phone or, or next to your Facebook um, uh, page. But the, these are the kinds of monitoring. They, they're anonymous, so they're not checking the individual person, but they're checking for behavior. And that's what we check for in the airport. We don't, 
we don't know the actual individual, the person and the address and so forth. We do know that they may be a frequent traveler uh, and we do know that you know they, they go to a particular area, but we don't know who they are per se. So the, the information is anonymous. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's see. So let's let me ask you a little a different question here. Um, and uh, it's around the demand for cargo. And this actually is one of the areas that I'm really interested in too, because in my former life, I used to work um, for Northwest and Delta Airlines in the cargo side of the business. So um, it's something I'm personally interested in. I see there was a question that came in. So let me just make sure I can find it um, here. So, okay, so it comes from um, uh, Hiroki Takeuchi, he is asking, how is the demand for cargo? I think now that there's, uh, there's, there's no direct flight from to China, isn't there more demand for cargo, such as for medical equipment and from China via Narita Haneda? So, uh, yeah. I can well, take that, Nozomi. Um, yeah, Steve, please go ahead. One of the things that we've been fairly uh, pleased about is that even though the passenger demand went down considerably with COVID, we did not see that much of a drop with the cargo. So where we were only able to maybe operate one flight a week, where we might have one flight a day, we were actually able to operate cargo flights that were completely full um, because of a demand of medical supplies and all kinds of transfers back and forth internationally. So our cargo actually did very, very well. We had, where we only had maybe at the most, maybe 30 flights in a month um, back in April, or I believe it was May, we had 1,500 flights in that same month for cargo. So that actually helped us uh, from a financial standpoint. And I think um, the demand has dropped off a little bit in cargo from most recently, but we still are doing pretty well there. So I think for us, we were very, very pleased with that. And we were able to, not only with the cargo alone, but we we're able to keep airplanes operating. We we're able to keep them mechanically updated. We we're able to keep our pilots, get their hours. So there was a lot of good things about uh, being able to, to satisfy that cargo demand for us. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I, I think the situation is the same uh, for Delta with cargo. Uh, you know, back in April through June, we had, a, we had a very strong demand of uh, shipping things from China or from Korea to the United States. So even though you know, our, our passenger flights seem to be empty, we are carrying lots of cargo. So that kind of seems to be settling down a little bit, but the cargo definitely has been uh, a strong part in uh, our company since the COVID. Wonderful. Great, thank you. So that kind of leads to a, a different question. So since there's been um, lots of planes being grounded, what do you think the longer long-term effect will be on the equipment? So the question, what is the effect of long-term storage of the grounded aircraft during the pandemic? Okay, uh, for Delta, uh, you know, we, we have lots of uh, airplanes which are not used. And unfortunately, we had lots of all the aircrafts. You know, believe it or not, we, we, we carried lots of MD-80, MD-90s, those kind of old-fashioned aircrafts, and also like a 767s or some old 777s. So we, we kind of took this up as an opportunity to retire some of those old aircrafts so that we can, you know, we can use more fuel efficient aircraft. So, so back to your question, Nozomi, uh, we, we don't have any, so many spare aircraft just because we retired many of the old aircraft which are not fuel efficient. Wonderful, wonderful. So, uh, Nozomi, for us, uh, for Japan Airlines, there was really two things that um, we were able to do. Um, and this is a concern because if airplanes sit there for long periods of time, uh, there's usually things that go wrong eventually. So for us, we have a pretty modern fleet on the international. Uh, it's all 787s or triple uh, sevens aircraft, 300. So two things that we did was number one, we sped up the maintenance check. Every, uh, we have long checks that happen every four or five years. So we just accelerated those. We kept our aircraft technicians and maintenance people working on the airplanes, updating them. 
Uh, and so instead of having to pull them out of service in the future, like we normally have to do, we were able to get all the airplanes up to snuff right now, technically. And then, as I said earlier, we we're actually able to fly those airplanes in some cases with just cargo only just to keep them working. So for us, we felt like it was a, it was a pretty good situation. We didn't have to retire any aircraft because we don't really have any aircraft internationally that are older than maybe 10 years, so. Great, thank you, Steve. So this is another question for the airline folks, um, comes from John, and is how will the consumer's cost of air travel be affected with all of these new measures being implemented? How much can we expect to see the ticket price rise? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and try that one. I'll let Aki think about it. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, one of the things that we, we know about the uh, cost on the airline side is if you go back 20 years ago, 25 mm -hmm. years ago, and you look at the cost of air, air, air travel back then, it hardly ever even went up in terms of inflation. So in other words, there's not been a big premium, and we've still been able to reduce costs in a lot of ways, uh, fuel, uh, more efficient engines on the airplanes, uh, more efficiency ways of working, uh, technology uh, increasing and making things more efficient. So I think that this is going to be another challenge for all of us uh, with the COVID. It's going to make us uh, technically try to find ways to do things better. And I think it's going to be spread along a two to five year uh, range because you're not going to be able to bring all the travel back in one year. You already know some international carriers are saying they're not going to fly a schedule that's even half of what they're doing today, what they're doing in 2019 until the end of 2021. And some of them I'm hearing as late as 24, 25. So the only good thing about that is it does give us time to see about how we can match the cost versus the demand, which is the most important thing in our business. Yeah, yeah and I, uh, adding to Steve, uh, I, I see different uh, trends in domestic and international market. Looking at the domestic market in the United States, you know, there are local suppliers who, fly, who like to fly anyway. So, you know, airlines like uh, JetBlue or Southwest, they are doing some, some crazy things. You know, they, they offer like a $20 fare between Miami and uh, LaGuardia, and we need to compete with those airlines. So in those markets that we compete with local carriers harshly, the prices have gone down. But uh, looking at the international market, I think airlines tend to reduce capacity. So we don't really need to compete with local carriers, but we try to maintain certain yield so that we can fly, you know, we can keep flying only with uh, you know, 20 or 30 passengers. So uh, looking at the international market, I don't see a big dilution of the fares, but I think it's uh, difficult for airlines to raise a fare just because the demand is so weak. Great, thank you. Thank you, Exxon. Thank you, Steve. Um, the next question I'd like to ask um, Elliot, it, it's regards to airports. So in the US, what is the Department of Homeland Security T, uh, TSA Immigration's Customs um, doing to help improve airport traffic at international airports? What are they doing to help improve airport, airport traffic? traffic? And I'm not uh, sure exactly what that exactly means when you say Im improve. Um, it might help, um, what you're talking about the crowd. Yeah. Um, yeah, is there any like uh, support, help, or initiatives that they're doing to help the airports? I mean, they, they have uh, things like global entry program, uh, your e-passport. Um, I, I guess that's what the question is asking, you know, how can they improve the efficiency of reducing lines and so forth. Um, at least that's the interpretation I'm getting from the question. Uh, so yes, the, the, the Customs Border Protection, they have uh, global entry, they have uh, various technology programs that they use to, to fast track um, known, what are essentially known travelers. So you're interviewed before and they know basically everything about you. You enter your known travel program in your Delta app or whenever you make your reservation. And so they already know all about you before you arrive at your destination. So there, there are programs like that, and you voluntarily enter those programs. Is there anything specific to COVID that they have um, done or launched or planning to do to support? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, right, right now they're trying to keep staff safe. Um, we've had 
a high rate of infection, especially among TSA agents. Um, so the aim is really to try and keep them as safe as possible. Um, until we have more of these uh, technology in the airports are working with TSA, as I mentioned earlier, to implement uh, security checkpoints that are, that are touchless. So it's not just uh, facial recognition check-in, but also uh, touchless security using facial recognition for, um, for your, your ID on the domestic side. So once that is, is implemented, that will help a lot to reduce touch points for, for passengers going through security. So yes, we, we are doing some work with TSA, as I mentioned earlier. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we are actually at this two minute before the hour mark. There are, we have so many more questions that we need to answer, but unfortunately, um, we don't have enough time to do this. So I, I can see Paul smiling. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna head towards closing remarks. What I, what I, what we might be able to do um, is gather these questions and find a way that we can answer them, um, answer them back to you. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have to discuss it among the panels and um, with, with Paul and Yoshi, but thank you so much, um, Elliot, Steve, Aksan for being here today. Um, and thank you everyone. I'm gonna hand over to Paul and Yosan for it to close. Great, well, um, thank you so much to Zomi um, for moderating the program and thank you to our panelists for your time, enthusiasm, and willingness to share your thoughts with the global audience. Um, and I would like to share in terms of the questions, um, we would be glad to, to receive them at our info account for Dallas-Fort Worth. So um, we can also talk amongst the panelists, but um, if anyone would like to send those questions now, um, just send them to info, so that is info at jasdfw.org. We'd also like to, ex to express gratitude to all of the attendees for your eagerness to learn. And um, we do apologize that we could not get to all of your questions. We would now like to share some upcoming events. So you'll, you'll see it on your screen in just a moment. Uh, first, I will share events from the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. Then I will talk about programs from the Japan American Society of Georgia. Next week on the evening of September 2nd, the Dallas-Fort Worth chapter will have its first ever virtual Otsukimi Moon Viewing Festival, which will include performances from professional shamisen and koto musicians, community groups from Dallas, the Dallas International Friendship City, which is Sendai in Miyagi Prefecture. It, there also will be a dango cooking demonstration and commercials from Japanese restaurants in North Texas. And please note that this is different than the Georgia event, which I will discuss in a few moments. On September 17th, the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Worth will host a program on the effect of anime and Japanese pop culture on the rest of the world. You can see it on the screen there. Next, we have um, events from our friends in Georgia. Great, so um, do not forget that the virtual Japan Fest Atlanta is still taking place through September 30th. Activities include contests, online performances, webinars, workshops, merchandise, and more. Later this evening, so uh, this evening for all of our US attendees, um, the Japan American Society of Georgia presents a discussion on the film After the Storm, which addresses modern family life in Japan. You are encouraged to support the Japan American Society of Georgia member restaurants and watch the movie before attending the program tonight. On September 5th, the Japan American Society of Georgia will have an event on Japanese pop music with professor and musician Dr. Capital who ironically lives in North Texas and has performed at many events for the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. On September 9th, as you can see there, uh, the Japan American, Japan American Society of Georgia will host a virtual Tsukimi Moon Viewing Gala featuring special messages from Atlanta area dignitaries and performances by Japanese musicians. And please note that this is a separate event than the Dallas-Fort Worth Otsukimi, which is on September 2nd. Lastly, on September 16th, the Japan American Society of Georgia, in partnership with a number of Georgia Chambers of Commerce, will co-organize a discussion on sustainability and manufacturing, as you can see from the, the flyer there. Panelists include an executive from Japanese firm YKK Corporation of America, among others. And we encourage you to, to check jasdfw.org, that is for Dallas-Fort Worth, and jasgeorgia, 
So again, jasgeorgia.org for, for, uh, for more information on those programs. We kindly ask that you also complete a post-event survey, which will pop up in your browser once the program ends. This concludes this afternoon's program. Thank you so much for attending and have a great rest of the day for our U.S. attendees and a great rest of the evening or morning for those around the world. Thank you so much.